In this video, I'm going to run through the AQA GCC Combined Science Trilogy Physics Paper 1 on the Foundation tier. I hope you find it useful. The first question, question 1 says, there are many different energy resources. Question 1.1 asks you to, which two of the following energy resources are renewable. So just run through them. So you know biofuel is renewable, coal is not renewable, gas is also not renewable because it's a fossil fuel, geothermal is renewable, and nuclear fuel isn't. So they're the first two marks for this paper. In question 1.2, it says some non-renewable energy resources are more reliable than others. Which statement correctly describes a reliable resource? So a reliable resource is it's predictable, so you know when it will be you'll be able to use it. It does not burn fuel, is incorrect. It will never run out is incorrect, because it doesn't describe reliable resources because um coal and gas and nuclear are all reliable. Um, and they will run out. And it's cheap to use, it's not necessarily the case. It's basically you, you can depend on the energy whenever you need it. The next question is in 1.3. says, figure 1 shows a wind farm. You can see the wind farm there. It says, the total power output of the wind farm is 19.6 megawatts. All the wind turbines have the same power output. And it wants you to find out which what is the power output of one wind turbine. To be able to answer this question, we need to find out how many wind turbines there are, are to begin with. So you can see on here that we have got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 wind turbines. So you've got 7 wind turbines and we know the total power output is 19.6 megawatts. We do 19.6 divided by the 7 to find the uh, power output of one of the wind turbines. So you can see my calculation there, which is... 19.6 divided by 7 gives me 2.8 megawatts, and that is the correct answer. Next question is 1.4. It says, Give two reasons why people might not like having wind turbines in their homes. So, there's a whole host of reasons for that. But the mark scheme is looking for any two of the following. So, you can have any two of the ones I'll just put on the screen, which is that they cause visual pollution, noise pollution, they can be dangerous to birds, or they may lower house prices. The first two are the most common reasons why people don't like wind turbines at their home. Question 1.5 um, says, Figure 2 shows that electricity generated by different energy resources in the UK. The total amount of electricity generated was the same in 2014 and in 2015. However, there are changes in the amounts of different energy resources used between 2014 and 2015. It wants you to explain the environmental impacts of these changes. So first of all, you can see that coal has, has decreased, it's gone down. Um, the use of coal has gone down from 30% to 22%. So that means that less greenhouse gases will be um, emitted into the atmosphere and it will be contributing to global warming less. We can see that gas has stayed the same at 30 and 30. Nuclear power has actually increased. Okay, it's gone up from 19% to 21%. And we can also see that the other fuels have stayed the same at 2%. But renewable resources has increased from 19 to 25%. So you'll be assessing this question using the following level descriptors. So level 2, you need relevant points, reasons, causes are identified. And they need to be given in a logical uh, detail and linked to form a clear account. And level 2, which is one or two marks, is that points are identified and stated simply, but their relevance is not clear and there's no attempt at logical linking. So in order to get three or four marks this question, you need to try and have a go at logically linking your ideas together. So I'm now placed on the indicative content, which is basically how you get the marks. These are the sorts of things you could say to in order to get the marks. But remember how you're assessed is using these points here. So you can see that we've already stated that uh, less fossil fuels are, are burnt because coal goes down. And that means that there will be um, less carbon dioxide released, less greenhouse gases, and less global warming. It also means that there will be less acid rain as well. The next point that we can make here is that there's more nuclear fuel, which means that we could be more hazardous waste produced. Um, and that we'd have to dispose of afterwards, which could be radioactive. We could also say more renewables used, and that means again that there's a decrease in carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases as well. Um, and finally, we can say that the gases remain the same um, <clears throat> in terms of what's happened to the fuels, and so have the other fuels as well. If you you could also in, in indicate how what percentage they've risen by or increased or decreased by, 
So you see we've got an 8% decrease in coal, a 6% increase in renewables, and a 2% increase in nuclear. So 6 of the 2 give you the 8 decrease that we have for the coal. So it's about linking those ideas together in a logical sequence, and that's how you get the Marxist question. So that brings us to the end of that question. Please give yourself a mark after 10, and then we can move on to question 2. Question 2 says, Figure 3 shows a mobile phone being recharged by a possible power source. 2.1 says, why does the battery in the phone need recharging? And it asks you to tick one of the boxes. So the reason that the charge, uh, the phone needs recharging is the chemical store of energy in the battery has been depleted. So the store of chemical energy in the battery has been reduced. That would be the correct answer. And we just, we'll double check the other ones to make sure they're not correct. But the store of thermal energy in the battery is reduced. But it's not thermal energy, it's chemical energy. Kinetic energy is the next one. It's not kinetic energy because we know it's chemical and the final one says the store of gravitational energy. But again, we know it's none of those because we know it's the store of chemical energy in the battery that has been reduced. So that's the correct answer there. So now we're on to question 2.2. Uh, on this question, it says the power source provides a current of 1.86 amps, which is going to underline in blue, um, and a potential difference of 3.9 volts. It also says to then calculate the power of the power source. It tells us to use the equation that is given here. The power is potential difference, which we've highlighted in, in green, multiplied by current, which we highlighted originally in blue. And that says choose the correct unit from the box. So the first thing to do really is realise that power is measured in watts, and so that will be W. So we've already got the unit mark correct there. The next part then is to go on and put the numbers into the calculation. So we know that power is potential difference times current, so that means that power is 3.9 volts multiplied by 1.86 amps. So now put the, uh, the calculation on here, so we've got power is potential difference multiplied by current, so power is 3.90 multiplied by 1.86, and we put that into the calculator and we get an answer. So now I've completed that answer for you, so we're doing 3.9 times 1.86, we get power being 7.254, I've rounded that to 7.25, so that's three significant figures, which is, is in keeping with the the value we given in the question, and then we get the mark for saying that it's measured in watts. So the three marks for that question, one is for that bit there, where we're doing the 3.9 times 1.86, one is for the correct answer, and one is for the correct units. So 2.3 says the student needs a new power source. Figure 4 shows three different size power sources. Here we've got the compact, the large, and the high capacity. Table 1 gives data about these different power sources, and here is table 1. And it gives you the idea that compact has one charge and its mass in grams is 100. Whereas a large um, charger has five charges and its mass in grams is 200. Whereas the high capacity gives you 10 charges uh, but its mass in grams is 600. The student can choose a large, the student chose a large power source. It says suggest why the student chose a large power source um, and you get four marks for this question. So to give ourselves some structure to this answer, we need to compare the large power source to the compact power source and probably look for, to get two marks there, and then compare the large source to the high capacity power source and again look to get uh, two marks there. So if we compare it to the compact source, you can see that in terms of the number of charges, we've got, we've got five times as many charges, um, but the mass in grams increases uh, by twice the mass, so two times 100 gives you 200. So you can see the two marks. This one it says compared to the compact charge, it has five times the number of charges, but we've only twice the mass. That's a mark for each of those. And now we just need to compare it to the high capacity charger. So compared to the high capacity charger, it's half the number, it has half the number of charges, which obviously is a setback. However, it is a third of the mass, so it's much, much lighter. And again, those would get you a mark for each of those points that's made there. So mark there. And I'm out there. So please can you use a mark out of eight for the question, and then we'll move on to question three. So now we're on to question three, which is a figure five shows a girl skateboarding on a semi circular ramp. The girl has a mass of 50 kilograms. It wants you to calculate the gravitational potential energy of the girl at the top of the ramp using the equation that gravitational potential energy is equal to mass times gravitational field strength times height. And it gives you gravitational field strength here as 9.8 newtons per kilogram. So just underline that in blue. If we go back through and look at the, what, we, what else we've been given in the question, we can see that we've got a mass of 50 kilograms 
and over here you can see that the height is four meters. So now adding the equation, here we can see that we're using GP equals M for mass times G for gravitational first run times height. And I put the numbers in. So GP is 50 kilograms multiplied by 9.8 newtons per kilogram multiplied by 4 meters. And if you put that into your calculator, you get the correct answer of 1960. And there is your correct answer now of 1960 joules. And the next part of the question is the girl has a speed of 7 meters per second at the bottom of the ramp. Calculate the kinetic energy of the girl at the bottom of the ramp using the equation kinetic energy is 0 0.5 times mass times speed squared. So now we use the equation down here where I say kinetic energy is equal to 0 0.5 times m for mass times v squared for speed squared. I put the numbers in of 0 0.5 times 50 times 7 squared and you place that into your calculator. Once you place that into your calculator you get the correct answer of 1225 joules. The mark for this question, you get a mark for basically for both of them for writing the correct numbers. So for GP, it's 50 times 9.8 times 4 is one mark. And then the right answer of 1960. For the kinetic energy equation, it's writing 0 0.5 times 50 times 7 squared is the first mark. And you get the correct answer of 1225 is the second mark. So question 3.3 .3 says not all of the GPE has been transferred to kinetic energy. It asks you which two statements explain why. It's for worth two marks. It asks you to tick two boxes. So the first box says some of the energy is wasted. Well, that's true. So we're going to tick that one. The mass of the girl is too low. Is is not correct. No, <coughs> the mass doesn't have an effect on energy transfer really because the mass is the same two equations. The ramp is not high enough. Again, that won't necessarily affect why they wouldn't be the same. The gravitational potential of the girl is not zero. That is the second correct answer because obviously she still has some gravitational potential energy left because she's not quite at the ground. And the speed of the girl is too great again is a waste answer. So those are your two correct answers for this question. Question 3.4 says so explain how lubricating the wheels of the skateboard can increase the speed of the girl and wants you to use ideas about energy in your explanation. So this question the exam model wants you to come out with these three point following marks. So the first one is that lubrication will reduce the amount of friction. So saying that the amount of friction with less is, is worth one mark. This means that more energy is usually transferred gets you the second mark. Okay, so the, because there's less waste due to friction, more of it will more of the energy will usually transferred. And finally, that means that you'll get a greater kinetic energy. So it's those three marks. One for saying that you reduce friction, one for saying that, that means that more energy is usually transferred, and the final mark for saying that you have a greater kinetic energy. So that brings us to the end of this question. Please give yourself a mark out of nine and then get ready to move on to the next question. Question four says so some ceiling lights in the home are connected to the mains by a two core cable. And figure six up here shows a ceiling light. It's got insulation and it's got copper wire <coughs> with some more insulation. It says suggest why some ceiling lights do not have an earth wire. Is the first part of question, question 4.1. So the marks of this question are awarded as follows. The first one is for saying that they're not made of metal. You could also be credited a mark if you'd mentioned that they're made of plastic. And the second mark is for saying there's no chance or little chance of an electric shock. Question 4.2 asks you to write down the equation that links charge flow, current and time. So charge flow, remember, is current times time. So there's the correct answer. Charge flow is equal to current times time. You could have got a mark for saying that Q is equal to I times T. In question 4.3, it says there is a current of 2.95 amps in one of the copper wires for 60 seconds. And you want to calculate the charge flow through the wire. So now what you need to do is you need to put in the numbers. So charge flow is going to equal the 2.95 amps for your current multiplied by 60 seconds. So I've placed these numbers into your calculation now. So charge flow is equal to 2.95 amps multiplied by 60 seconds. And that gives me an answer of 177 coulombs. If you round that to 180 coulombs, you would still get the mark. Question 4.4, it shows figure 7, which shows a current potential graph for a piece of copper wire. And we can see that we've got current here and potential difference there. We can see that for a piece of wire, the IV graph, or the current potential difference graph, is a straight line going through the origin. I want you to draw another line on figure 7 for a wire with a different resistance. So all we need to do there is draw a wire 
the, it goes in the same quadrants as this. So it starts in this quadrant and finishes in this quadrant and goes through the origin. So a line like that, that I've drawn there would be acceptable for two marks. The marking points of this question given here, so basically a straight line with a different positive gradient, as you've seen by mine there, and a straight line with positive gradient going through the origin. So the idea is it should go through the origin and it should go into this quadrant and that quadrant only. And you get two marks for that. Question 4.5 asks you to draw a circuit symbol for a fuse. The circuit symbol for a fuse is shown here. So it's a rectangular box with a straight line going through it. It must have a straight line going through it, otherwise it would just be a resistor if it was a rectangular box. And so again, that's worth a one mark. Question 4.6 says, describe how the movement of copper particles and the wire changes when copper melts. So the first mark here is for saying that as a solid, the particles are in a regular arrangement and they move by vibrating around a fixed position. That's the first mark. All we need to do for the second mark is explain how the particles will now move in a liquid. The second mark is for saying that some of the bonds between the particles break so they are free to move around. I think it's your two marks for that question. The final question, 4.7, says old copper wires are melted when they are recycled. Calculate the energy you need to melt 500 kilograms of copper at its melting point. Specifically related to the heat of fusion of copper is 200 kilojoules per kilogram. And I want you to use the physics equation sheet. If you look at the equation sheet, you'll get the equation that thermal energy for a change of state is mass times specific latent heat, or equals ml. So we've got E equals M times L here, which is the equation I'm going to use. To do that, I need to know what M is, which is the 500 kilograms. And L, it says here, is 200 kilojoules per kilogram. So I need to change 200 kilojoules per kilogram into joules per kilogram. And I do that by times by 1,000, like I've done here. So now I need to substitute the numbers into this equation by doing 200,000 multiplied by the 500. So I put the numbers in now to get 500 times 200,000, and that will give you an answer of 100 million, or 1 times 10 to the 8. So the correct answer is here now, that E is 100 million joules, or E equals 1 times 10 to the 8 joules, so don't be afraid to use standard form. And that brings us to the end, to end of question 4, so please give yourself a mock out of 13 for this question. The remaining questions on the paper, questions 5 to 7, are also the same as the higher tier questions 1 to 3. So please now go to the higher tier video to watch how to answer questions 5 to 7, which remember are going to be the same as questions 1 to 3 on the higher tier paper. Thank you for listening to this video, and I really hope you found it useful. Thank you. Goodbye.